in this semester. Oh, uh, that's, I mean, um, uh, uh, yeah, that's quite different. Yeah. It's a different animal. Yeah. yeah. This, is, this is what's called point, point set topology, not algorithm topology. Yeah. Uh, she goes about, yeah, she says to do this, she goes about it. Okay, let's get started, please. Okay, so remember what we have, right? We have uh, we have this theorem which we're not we're not, we're not proving that says that um, uh, that there is this thing called R, right? There exists an ordered field, right? There exists an ordered field uh, that one contains Q as a subfield, right? And two has the least upper bound property. Has the least upper bound property. Okay? And that field we, we call that guy R. Uh, we call it R. Right? R the real numbers. Okay? So it's something that includes, you know, includes the rational numbers inside of it, right? And the rational numbers, um, uh, you know, includes the rational numbers using the same, um, so it has its own, you know, it has its own addition and multiplication. And with that addition and multiplication, Q sits inside of it, but right, using the same addition and multiplication. Um, uh, okay. And um, it has, most importantly, it has the least upper bound property. Okay, and that's all we know about R. Okay. You don't know anything more than that. It contains Q, and it has the least of the bound property. Okay. Um, what we're going to see is that um, uh, that uh, we can get certain properties of R um, just from just from this description. There, there are things that follow uh, right out of this description. Um, professor, yes. question. So yeah. can we say, based on the fact that R has the least upper bound property, can we say that it has the greatest lower bound property? Yes. Now? Yes. Because yeah, what, so what we showed last time. Yeah. yeah. So theorem properties of R. Okay, the first one is this thing called the Archimedean property. Archimedean property. Um, given any x bigger than zero um, and y in R, um, there exists an n in the natural numbers such that nx is bigger than y. There exists an n such that n times x is bigger than y. Okay, so this is called the Archimedean property. Next. Uh, when do we shift from using this notation to just mean a general order to using greater than or less than? Well... Will we ever do that? Okay, so right now... Um, Yeah, so this is an order, but it's it's the order. Yeah, so it's um, it's, a, it's a little tricky because the order is the one that, that Q has also, right? So in some sense, you can say, well, I know it, I know this thing because it's the one that, that Q has, right? But um, uh, but you don't you don't want to, you know. Uh, but it's you know we haven't really. Um, Yeah. Um, at this point, I'd say just stick with it as a as an abstract order. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So you know, um, one thing I've seen in one book describing the Archimedean property is it says that whenever you have a spoon, no matter how small your spoon is, and no matter how large the bathtub is, you can eventually empty the bathtub with the spoon. <laughs> right? That's basically what this is saying. Right? <laughs> right? So you got this is your bathtub. Right? This is the spoon. Right? And eventually, you know, you know after using the spoon some multiple of times, right? You're gonna you're gonna surpass the, the volume of the bathtub. Okay, so that's that's one picturesque way of remembering Archimedes principle. Okay, 
Um, Archimedean uh, principle gives us uh, something called the density of Q. So Q is dense in R. And what we're going to mean by that is that for all x and y in R, um, uh, where we can assume that x is less than y, um, there exists a P in the rationals that lies between them. Right? So you can always, between any two real numbers, you can always insert, a, you'll, you'll, you can always assume that there exists a rational number. <coughs> okay. So, and these we're going to prove using the, basically the least upper bound property. Okay. So the proof of one, right? So the proof of the first one is we're going to do it by, by contradiction. Right. So suppose that um, that right. So we, we have that we have our x, we have our y, and suppose that uh, for any n in n that uh, n x is always less than or equal to y. Okay. No matter no matter how many times we 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 use the spoon, we never. You know the, the bathtub still remains unemptied. Okay. Okay. So who um, who remembers what we're going to do next, or what's the what's the next move? Suppose that no matter what n we have, n times x is always is always you know smaller than less than or equal to one. What are we going to do next? The least upper bound. We well, at least at least upper bound property, right? So you say, well, look. Right. What we're saying, what this is saying, is that um, right. This is saying that the set n x, where n is bigger than n, has an upper bound. Right. That's the same thing as saying, well, if we look at the set of n x's, right, one x, two x, three x, blah blah blah, right, that set has an upper bound y. So right, this set has an upper bound y. So by the least upper bound property, by the least upper bound property of R, we know there exists a least upper bound of this set. Uh, let's call this set A. Uh, whenever I use this colon, it means I'm defining, like let, let A be defined as this set. I'm, I'm naming, right? A is this guy. There's a least upper bound of A, call it M. So this is the we have the least upper bound for this for this set here, right? For the set A, right? And then we play a trick. We say, well, look, um, uh, in that case, uh, m minus x is not an upper bound. I mean, right? M minus x is is not going to be an upper bound because m was the least upper bound, right? m was the least upper bound. We've got something smaller than it, so this is not an upper bound. Professor, uh, yeah. does it suffice to just define m to be the least upper bound of a without proving it? We're just calling it. We, so we know that an upper, a least upper bound exists by the least upper bound property. Okay. Give it a name, m. Okay, so we got, so we don't need to show that uh, there is no other element that exceeds m, which is an upper bound, <coughs> or there is no other e element which is less than m, which is an upper bound. No, we are given that. Okay. We're given that by the least upper bound property, right? Okay. The least upper bound property says, if you, ha as long as you have an upper bound, you're guaranteed to have a least upper bound. That least upper bound is the least of the upper bounds. Right? It is. It's an upper bound. 
That is, we guarantee the existence of an upper bound that is less than less than or equal to all other upper bounds. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just thanks to the thanks to the property of R. So, uh, everybody all right? Okay. So in that case, m minus x is not an upper bound of a, right? And so, right, if it's not not an upper bound of a, then we know that um, m minus x uh, must be um, less than uh, n o some some multiple of x. <coughs> It's not an upper bound of this set, so there must be somebody in here bigger, right? It's not an upper, right? These guys, if it's not an upper <coughs> bound of this set, so there must be one of these guys who is bigger, right? So there must be uh, there is an n not an n such that such that this is true. Like that's that's exactly what it is for this not to be an upper bound. Okay. Um, okay. And how do we finish it off? Move the x. Move the x to the other side. We say, well, in that case, m is less than n not plus one x. <coughs> okay. M is less than one uh, n not plus one x. Right. So that's a contradiction. Right. Because M was supposed to be an upper bound of all multiples of x, right? It was supposed to be an upper bound of all multiples of x, but here we have m is less than this multiple of x, right? This natural multiple of x. <coughs> so contradiction, and so uh, we know that um, there must uh, uh, there must be some n that for which nx is bigger than y. Right? Contradiction. Uh, thus, there must be some n such that nx is bigger than y. Okay. Yes. I mean, Roger. <laughs> Okay, so <coughs> remember, so let's, let's, you know, remember the, the idea of the proof, okay? So you say, well, we're trying to show that some multiple of n, uh, some multiple of x is going to be bigger than y. Suppose that they're all smaller than y. In that case, there is this least upper bound of all multiples of n, okay? This guy, it's bigger than all multiples of n. Uh, all, all multiples of x. It's bigger than a billion x, a trillion x, whatever, whatever, whatever. Okay. Okay. But it's the least of the least of the upper bounds. Okay. So then you subtract off uh, you subtract off x. You say, okay, that's not an upper bound, right? So if it's not an upper bound, there must be some multiple of x that's bigger than, it, right? But in that case, m is less than. Uh, you know, some number plus one times x. M is less than some multiple of x. But m was supposed to be, m was supposed to be bigger than, um, bigger than all multiples of x. But it's less than this multiple of x, this natural multiple of x. That's a contradiction. Okay. So what we assumed at the beginning must have been false. It can't have been the case that all multiples of x were less than y. One of them must be greater than y. At least one of them must be greater than one. Okay. okay. Everybody all right? Okay. Uh, okay. So let's go to the second one. We'll use the first one to prove the second one. Uh, so the second one is the density. Um, okay. Let me come over here. So uh, we're trying to show that we can we can squeeze an irrational number between any real numbers, and what we do is we say, okay, well, um, here's the proof. So remember that we assumed that uh, x was less than y, right? In other words, that y minus x is bigger than zero. Okay. okay. 
So y minus x is a positive number. Um, by, by the Archimedean property, we know that um, there exists some natural number such that n times yx, y minus x is bigger than one. Okay. So this is the spoon, this is the <coughs> this is the spoon, this is the bathtub. We're taking one as the bathtub. Okay. You say, okay, well, there's gotta be some multiple of it that multiple of the spoon that's bigger than the bathtub. Okay. Okay. We do exactly the same thing. Uh, also, we know that there exist m1 and m2 natural numbers such that um, m1 times 1 is bigger than nx, and m2 times 1 is bigger than negative nx. Okay. okay. So, right. so we, we have this number n, right? We start with the spoon, y minus x. We get the number of, of times, the n is the number of times where you need to use that spoon to exceed 1. We use that number and consider nx and never negative nx. Okay? We use those guys as the new bathtubs. Okay? Those are your new bathtubs. Right? M1 times 1, you, we know that with the spoon, the one spoon, right, there's going to be some multiple of the one spoon that exceeds nx. We know there's going to be some multiple, another different multiple of the one spoon that exceeds um, negative nx. Okay. 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 Uh, so what do you have? You have that. Um, uh, You have, um, uh, right, this is the same thing. Find the properties of ordered fields. This is the same thing as negative m2 is less than nx, right? So by, um, so your pictures, you've got this negative m2, you've got your nx, and you've got your m1. Okay. So now, um, okay. So now, uh, consider the set of integers. Consider the set of integers where m is bigger than n x, but less than or equal to m one. Okay. So we're going to look at all the integers that are above nx and less than or equal to m1. Okay. Right. That's a finite set. That's, that's a finite set. So let um, m be the smallest. Okay. So there's going to be some minimal guy in there, right? There's going to be some smallest guy. Let's call that guy M. Okay. Um, well then, uh, if we look at M minus one, that's got to be small plus than or equal to an X. Right? Otherwise, M minus one would be the smallest guy. Right? So M minus one has to be has to be less than or equal to an X. Right. Um, okay. So then, uh, what do you have? Uh, that says that m is less than or equal to n x plus one. Right. N x plus one. And so what we get all together is that um, uh, n x all together. We get n x is less than m. m is less than or equal to n x plus one, right? Back here, back here with our with our initial statement, right? 
you have um, ny is greater than nx plus 1. Right? If I rewrite the, the initial statement, yeah. ny, this is the same thing as saying ny is bigger than nx plus 1. Right? So this is less than ny. Right? And then I divide everything by n, right? Divide everything by n. Um, we get that x is less than m over n, which is less than y. OK. In other words, we found a quotient of integers that lies between our x and y. Right? We found the rational number, we found an, a, a rational number that lies between our initial two real numbers. Okay. Um, Vanessa? Yeah. And what about the third um, nx plus 1? Can we just ignore that? Yeah, we don't need it, right? Okay. This is, the important part is this, mm -hmm. right? Because our goal is to, we had our x and y, we're, we're trying to find a, a, a rational number between them. Right? And we've done it. Okay. okay. So, right, so now uh, we have a very useful property that, um, you know, we didn't, we didn't assume this about our, our field to begin with. Right? We just had this field that contained, contained Q, and it satisfied the least upper bound property. But what we see is that it has to, because of that, it has to have this property that between any two numbers, there's always a rational number, Helen. Um, how do we know that M has a smallest element? Well, because there's only a finite number of integers, right? We know about integers, right? There's this integer and this integer. There's only you know, a finite number of integers between here and here. So when right. you have a finite set, there's definitely a smallest element. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, you can, I, I guess you can try, uh, if you, you can try and prove that if you want. Um, maybe as an exercise. Yeah. Okay. Like, if there were no smallest element, dot, 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 <laughs> <laughs> then would, the set would, could not be finite, right? Because whenever you pick something, then there would always be a smaller element. If I pick that smaller element, there's going to be another element. I pick that element, there's going to be another. Then you get an infinite set lying within your finite set. Contradiction. Hey, Mr. L. React quickly. A Q is an infinite amount of elements, obviously. Yes. So does R. Yes. So is the R a super duper infinity as opposed to Q? Yes, yes, oh. yes. So what we'll see... So infinity is different. Yes. Yes, so what we're going to do in chapter 2, yeah, in chapter 2 we'll, we'll, we'll hit on this for just a second, um, that there are different kinds of, of infinite sets. They're so-called countable, countably infinite sets and uncountably infinite sets. So. Um, professor, yes. can we assume m to be a real number and still get the same answer? No, because, because then you wouldn't, have a, you wouldn't necessarily get a rational number here. Right, you want a quotient of integers, right, where the bottom guy is not zero. Okay. Other questions? Okay, let's go on. Um, okay. Okay. So now we're going to use that, uh, what we've just done, the, uh, the, the density, to get um, the existence of all um, of, of, of roots of roots of positive numbers. Okay. So how do we know that um, the square root of, there exists a square root of two? Right, there was no square root of two in the rationals. Um, it turns out that uh, we're going to have all sorts of roots, you know, all possible roots. Um, uh, for positive numbers in the in the reals. Okay. So theorem existence of uh, roots. Okay. So um, 
the PM is given any uh, x bigger than zero, right? So x is some real number, given any uh, x in the real. So we're in the reals for now. So I'm not going to keep on saying. Given any um, x in the reals, given any natural number, there exists a unique uh, y bigger than zero in the reals such that y to the n equals x. Okay. So I guess I haven't used this before. Um, there exists a unique. Okay. There exists this exclamation point means that there's only one of them. Some people write a one after. Um, some people write an exclamation point. Whatever. I use the exclamation point. Okay. Okay. So, um, the proof of this is going to use a, a, a lemma, just a, a simple bound, um, that whenever you have positive numbers, um, then b to the n minus a to the n is less than b minus a times n b to the n minus 1. Whenever you have positive numbers, then the difference of your n powers is, uh, is smaller than this. Okay. And the proof of this is just uh, algebra. b to the n minus a to the n uh, can be factored as b minus a times b to the n minus 1 plus b to the n minus 2 a plus dot plus a to the n minus 1. So you multiply these two things together, you get this. Okay. So just algebra. Okay. But if you, since b is bigger than a, we know that um, you know, this, the first guy is b to the n minus 1. The second guy is b to the n minus 2 times a. Well, if I switch that a to a b, it gets bigger, right? So this becomes this is less than b to the n minus 1, et cetera, et cetera. I switch all the a's to b's. Well, this is less than b to the n minus 1, right? And I've got n, copy, n copies of them. So I see that this thing here is less than uh, a minus a times n copies of b to the n minus 1. You'll see why we, why we uh, did that calculation. We made that estimate in a second. Okay. Everybody all right? Everybody all right? Okay. Okay, let's go on. Um, so let's prove this thing, the existence of roots. Okay. So first off, um, you notice that um, uh, uh, if a root exists, uniqueness is obvious, right? Because if I have two roots, right? If you have two numbers, uh, if you have two numbers and one is th and they're not equal to each other. Well, when you take the nth powers of them, that's that relationship is going to be, be preserved, right? In that case, y1 to the n is less than y2 to the n, right? And so there's no way that it, that these both could be roots, <laughs> right? right? There's, you can't have two different numbers that are both roots of the same, nth roots of the same number, right? Um, as for positive guys, right? Um, to be proper, you should prove this using the properties of ordered fields. Okay, so maybe that's a, a little exercise if you want to try it. Like this is a, this this fact is a consequence of the properties of ordered fields, a simple consequence. Okay, so I'm not so uniqueness is is we don't need to worry about. What we need to worry about is. Does does a root exist at all? Does a root exist at all? Okay. Um, 
So uh, we just have one trick to play, right? What's our trick? We're in the real numbers. We only know, you know two things about the real numbers at this point, basically. Two important things. The first is least of profound property. The second is density, right? Okay, so, right, so we use the trick, the least of profound property, right? So set, um, uh, so let the set E be the positive real numbers, right? The positive real numbers whose nth power is less than uh, x. Positive real numbers whose nth power is less than x. Yes? Is it a plus sign or a t? That's a t. <laughs> <laughs> Let me shorten it on both sides to make it more more ambiguous. Plus sign. Are you talking about positives or like? Oh. <laughs> no. So we just do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. No. Um, yeah, uh, the joke at the University of Chicago about one professor was that he only used two symbols, the alpha and gamma, where the alpha was rotated um, counterclockwise <laughs> and the gamma was rotated um, uh, clockwise. <laughs> he was sort of famous for being a poor, poor teacher. <laughs> Okay, so you know, right, this is the trick that, this is the obvious thing we're going to do, right? If you think back to what we're doing with the rational numbers, we looked at the, the set of guys whose squares were less than two, and we saw that there was no, there was no guy, there was, there was no, no least upper bound for that. If there were a least upper bound, that would have, that would have done it for us. So this is how we're going to find the roots, right? This is sort of the obvious move to make. Okay, okay. so um, observe that, uh, uh, e is not empty, right? E is not empty. Um, why? So uh, for take t to be x over one plus x, take t to be x over one plus x, and observe that um, <coughs> this is one. Uh, so notice this thing is less than x, right? Why is it less than x? Because I've taken x and I divide it by something bigger than 1, right? x was positive. Divide by something bigger than 1, this is less than x, right? Second observation, this thing is less than 1, right? Because x is smaller than 1 plus x. Okay. So I know that um, t is less than x, right? But I also know that t is less than 1. So if I keep on multiplying this guy by t, it gets smaller, right? If I multiply t by t, I get something smaller because t is less than 1, right? And I keep on doing that until I reach the nth power, right? And so I know t to the n you know, is smaller than t. Okay, t to the n is smaller than t, uh, which is smaller than x, and so I know that there is somebody in this set, right? x over 1 plus x is, is in the set, so my set is, is, is not empty. Okay, okay. Uh, so I should call these guys a and b. So I'll use 1 and 2. Okay, part 2. Um, uh, Suppose that t is bigger than 1 over x. Okay. So again, that's bigger than 1, and that's bigger than x. Okay. Notice that t is bigger than 1. Notice that t is, t is bigger than x. Uh, but then, using the same set kind of reasoning, t to the n is going to be bigger than t, right? t is bigger than 1, multiply it by itself, you get bigger, right? So t to the n is bigger than t, uh, which is bigger than x. 
right? So it's too big, right? This T doesn't work. This T is not an E. Okay, what am I saying? That if T is bigger than one over one plus X, then T is not in the set. Right? In other words, if I contrapose that, uh, then if T is in E, then T must be less than equal to one plus X. Right? If T is bigger than one plus X, then it's not in E. If it's in E, it must be less than or equal to 1 plus x. Right? In other words, 1 plus x is an upper bound of Okay. Right? Why are we doing this? Because we want to use the least upper bound property. Right? To use the least upper bound property, we need to know that this set is not empty and has an upper bound. Okay, so we showed one that this guy is in the set. You know, x over one plus x is in the set. Two that one plus x is an upper bound for the set. Okay, so we can use the least upper bound. So there exists a suit p in the real numbers. Okay. Call it. And our hope is that y to the n equals x. Okay. Okay. So, um, okay. So we're gonna uh, so we're gonna show that um, uh, we'll show that uh, uh, yn uh, y less than x and yn bigger than x lead to contradictions. We show that it can't be, can't be less and it can't be bigger. Okay. So let's do the first one. We claim that, um, no. suppose y to the n is less than x. OK, so our, our trick is that um, uh, we will, uh, our strategy is that we'll create, we can then create a little h, a small positive number h, such that um, y plus h to the n is also less than x. Right? Which will be a contradiction. Right? That'll be a contradiction because, you know, y was supposed to be um, uh, the upper bound for the guys whose nth power um, is less than x, but here we're finding somebody a little bit bigger. Okay. okay. So that would be the contradiction. Okay. Okay. So, um, So let's think, let's think. How are we going to make that x? So let's uh, do some scratch work here. Um, we want h, small h, such that um, y plus h to the 
log n is less is less than x, right? Okay. Um, I'm going to rewrite that in a funny way. I'm going to subtract off y to the n from both sides. So this is what we're hoping for. Right? We want an h such that this is true. Right? We want an h such that this is true, but that's the same thing as saying that this is true. Okay. Okay. So we want this thing. Uh, we want an h so that this is less than that. Okay. We say okay. Well, I know something about this, right? I know something about this. But from my lemma, from the lemma, you know that y plus h to the n minus y to the n is less than the difference h times n times uh, the larger, right? Uh, the larger y plus h to the n minus 1. Right? This is your b, this is your b, and this is your a. Right? b minus a is h, right? b minus a times n times b to the n minus 1. Okay. So we've got, we've got that lemma. So we know that, um, you know that this thing here right, is smaller than that. Okay. This thing here is smaller than that. Right? By the lemma. Yes, Ari. Do you have to specify that y is bigger than h? Or that y to the n is bigger than h? Well, h is a positive number, right? h is a positive number. y plus h is bigger than y. Is that what you're asking? Like, we need, oh, okay. b, we need b bigger than a, right? But this is y, and this is y plus h, where h is positive. Right? So we're, we're OK. Thank you. OK. OK. So we have. Um, we have a control on the size of this thing. We want to make, we want, remember our goal. Right? Our goal is to make this thing smaller than that, right? But we have a control on the size of this thing. It's small, that, this thing is smaller than that. So what's our, what's our real goal? Our real goal is to make, we want h such that, let me move over here now. Our real goal, our, our, our new goal, is um, we want h such that um, uh, this thing is less than this. OK. B, h such that um, h is less than x minus y to the n over n y plus h to the n minus 1. Okay. Okay. But um, <coughs> assume that h is less than one. Right. So if I if I replace this by one, I get something smaller, right? I get something smaller, right? So. Uh, as long as, so assume, sorry, h is less than 1. So as, uh, as long as h is less than x minus y to the n over n y plus 1 to the n minus 1, well, that's smaller than this. And it's still, so our condition is satisfied. Okay, so as long as we get this, we're sort of shifting our goal, right? As long as we get this, then then our condition is satisfied. Okay. Sorry, I flagged down for a second. Okay. Okay. But so all we need to do is find an h that satisfies this. Right? We want an h that lies between this number and, and this number. Right? And we can do that because of why can we? Why can? Why does such an H exist? By by density, right? Here's a number. Here's another number. We can. There's always going to be some number between them. There's always going to be some rational number between these two guys. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> I just need to sort of unravel things, and that's 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 the end, right? So um, so. 
so that was the that was the scratch work, right? You were trying to prove this thing, you did all this work, and now then you write it up. Well, suppose and you pretend that you knew it all along. Like, well, suppose that y y to the n is less than x. Choose h uh, less than one. Choose h in the interval of zero one, such that h is smaller than x minus y to the n over n times y plus m one to the n n minus one. Okay. In that case. Um, <coughs> In that case, uh, then uh, h n y plus h to the n minus 1 is less than x minus y to the n. Right. But by the lemma, uh, we know that um, y plus h uh, to the n minus y to the n is less than the above, right? So hn y plus h to the n minus 1, which is less than x, x, plus x minus y to the n. Right? And so uh, y plus h to the n is less than x. Contradiction. And the proof of the opposite statement is exactly the same. It's just the mirror of, of, of this statement. Okay. So choosing, right, if, if you have something bigger, well, then you have something small. You know, so you, you do something very similar. Okay. Okay, so I'm not going to prove it. Uh, because it's, it's very similar, and also we are out of time. Any questions? Any questions? Hey, Mr. Allen. Do you believe that Leibniz and Newton are too big to get to the back? No, no. <laughs> I don't think so either. No, no. That Newton will run afterwards to justify the answer. This is, yeah, this is done much later. Yeah, I'll, uh, yeah. Okay, that's it. See you all on Monday.